This band had gotten close to a number one hit many times over the course of their first decade together. They had a bunch of hits, actually a bunch of classics, but this particular song, it changed everything. Not only gave them a number one hit across the globe, it's recharted four more times after the 80s. It was written at three in the morning. The band's founder, he brought it to the singer after that, who turned in one of the greatest vocal performances in music history, truly. With this song being further optimized by an amazing and unexpected musical weapon. Find out what that is coming up next with exclusive interviews. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you are looking to be the king of music trivia, you're going to dig this channel. You're going to find out facts you wouldn't find anywhere else. Make sure that you subscribe below right now. Click the bell so you always know when our interviews and our videos are dropping. Also, check out exclusive content on our Patreon. Latest merch as well from amazing artist Thomas Estrada. Rap Fink artist there. That's below as well. So it's time for another edition of our series, The New Standards. This is a show that takes an in-depth look into songs that transcend genre, decade, and really fats. Songs that are truly monumental touchstones in our culture and society that really set the bar for everything else. I am really excited to share more from an interview I just did with two songwriter Hall of Fame inductees, the primary songwriters behind the music of the legendary band Foreigner. Lou Graham, truly one of the greatest rock singers in history, and Mick Jones, one of the greatest songwriter producers. I mean, outside of Foreigner, Mick has also produced uh, Stormfront by Billy Joel, 5150 by Van Halen, just to mention a couple. As I've mentioned before, Foreigner has had more hits than really a majority of the bands in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and they've never even been nominated for this honor. They've sold over 80 million records. They've had 17 hits, including all of these classics. And you know, today's song might be the peak of their song craft. That's hard to believe. I want to know what love is. I want to know what love is. It was the first single released from their 1984 album, Agent Provocateur. It's an amazing song, incredible. Came to Mick Jones at three in the morning. Then when he brought it to the band, an interesting proposition presented itself. A way to enhance an already amazing song. It also included Tom Bailey of the Thompson Twins on keyboards and Dreamgirl star Jennifer Holliday, along with a phenomenal musical weapon. Find out what that was and how it came to Mick Jones and Lou Graham and our exclusive feature coming up next. Now, as we go into these interviews, I want to thank our sponsor, Clear. You know, I've talked about the lifesaver their nasal spray has been when I had a cold and how I now use it as a preventative. Then I found out that Clear has other amazing products like Spry Gum. Spry gum also contains xylitol. Chewing it will boost your dental health in many ways. It actually helps get rid of the bacteria in your mouth that causes cavities. Fluoride simply remineralizes the enamel and does nothing for the bacteria creating the acid. And that's backed by scientific data. The best thing about this though, it tastes great. I love chewing it because no matter what I've eaten, I pop a piece in and it makes my mouth so fresh. It feels like I just brushed my teeth. It's really cool. Click on the link below or up here in the info button to get your Spry Gum today. And make sure to leave a comment on Amazon. Spry Gum. Here are Lou Graham and Mick Jones with the story of I Want to Know What Love Is. Well, there were three years between albums at the time that you released Agent Provocateur. You know, three years is a, is a long time in music, but the first single to draw from that record Number one powerhouse power ballad of all time. I want to know what love is. I've got to take a little time. You had a different philosophy. You really wanted to rock coming off a jukebox here and some of those. Mick wanted to pursue a more softer side. But you took this ballad and you made it one of the most soulful vocals ever. I, I remember Mick uh, playing uh, the first first inklings of, of I Want to Know and Love is it was it was on a cassette and it was about 
25 or 30 seconds, and I I, I just heard the, the, the that keyboard opening that he has on that, you know, he played he played that. And started singing, gonna take a little time, and his wispy voice, you know, a little time to think things over, and that's about all he had, that much. And it moved me right then. A song that defines true and everlasting love, probably more than any song in rock history. I want to know what love is. I mean, just a massive song. It like charts about every five years, whether it's a remake or the original. I really, yeah. I love that story about how you wrote that song. It was so inspired. I, I want to set the stage, if you don't mind. You're in London, England. Yeah. It's two in the morning. You had the first three chords. Is that how it started? Yep. It was late at night. I couldn't make too much noise, although I had a little soundproof room. But um, uh, So I was playing p quite softly, and um, I just happened on these three chords as the intro for the song. I didn't know what it was when, I, when it came to me. I didn't know what it, it was part of a song, or there was nothing I had in mind, really. And so... Um, but I was so uh, kind of I had a special feeling about it. So I went into the bedroom and woke up my wife and um, wife yet at the time. But um, woke her up at two or three in the morning, and I said, "Listen, listen, I've got this great song. I think it's a great idea for a song. I've just written three or four words. Will you listen to it?" And she she said, "Yeah, sure." So she got out of bed, came in the studio, and uh, and we both listened to it together. And she, she looked at me with a bit of a frown. She said, what do you mean by you want to know what love is? Don't, don't you know what love is yet with me? <laughs> and I said, no, darling, no. This is, this is a whole, this is a different thing. This is more like universal love and, and love between people, uh, you know, our neighbors. And, but obviously it's about love too. Yeah, I said, I'm learning new things every day. We began working on the lyrics a little more and, and taking the song to to the B section after the verse. There's been heartache and pain. And and then culminating in, in the, the chorus. Now he had an idea already what he would like the chorus to be like, and that idea is what the chorus is. Now, you know, the verses in the in-between parts were, were all a little murky at that point, and we, we, spent, we spent a lot of time defining those pieces. So they would, they would set up that chorus in the same, same way that Jukebox Era was set up, you know? The soft, wispy opening, and then, then a, a, little, a little more affirming it, and, and then the, I want to know what love is, you know. know is. It was a, a wonderful experience. We spent weeks on that song. Obviously, it was after 4 Under 4, but we had begun working on some of the songs from Agent Provocateur, but, but really, we stopped everything when we, we wanted to work on uh, I Want to Know What Love Is. We stopped recording, and he and I spent about three and a half, four weeks we just went to each other's houses and worked. Then we went back into the studio and started started getting ready to record it in earnest. We recorded the music and uh, zeroed in on the tempo. Then a, f a friend of Mick's who he had known for about twenty five or thirty years came into the studio when we were when when they were recording the music, and, and he and Mick started talking. And Mick played him the little demo that that Mick and I had been working on. The gentleman says, "I've got just the thing for that song." He says, Mick, he says, you know I work for a gospel label, don't you? Well, one of the most powerful parts of that song, of course, putting the New Jersey Mass Choir into it. Oh, My understanding, you were at lunch with Jerry Wexler, and you had That's the right. idea. Tell me about that. Well, um, Jerry had um, uh, a few friends over from the music business, and one of them had 
I, I think I'd played a snippet of the song and I said I was considering, uh, my first consideration was to try and get um, Aretha Franklin singing a duet with Lou. That, that was sort of the first in, inspiration I had. But over the course of uh, lunch, one, one of Jerry's friends at the table said he just purchased a catalog of gospel choir uh, recordings. And he said there was one one particular group that were phenomenal, and uh, they just lived over the water in uh, New Jersey. And and they are up and coming, and their last album was a smash. I'd like you to listen to this choir, and if you can somehow envision this choir singing that chorus. And um, he said, "I'll send you some of the uh, I'll send you some of the tracks of these groups, and see what you think. You might be able to use them in the song." And so we listened to to some of their album and the the voices were spectacular and their voicings i listened and i was blown away by the power they had enough people who who could ad lib a little bit but then they tucked themselves back in as a unit you know so we agreed to to have them come to the studio Asked them to come to the studio, and uh, it was quite an experience putting them down on, on tape at the time. Now, there was no lead vocals at that point. Mick was working with the choir in one studio, making sure all, all the notes were correct and, and their their uh, vocal expressions and everything were, were just right. I was in the next studio over singing the lead vocal, just me and the engineer. Usually mix right in there, suggesting this and suggesting that, and try that note and try that note. Nobody was around at all, just myself and the, the studio engineer. A rock band had never recorded with a gospel choir up to that point, not, and it posed some challenges. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it posed some challenges. Tell us about that. I love the story about what you did in the studio. Well, they had never been in the studio um, recording before. They always recorded in the church, so they were not very comfortable in the studio surroundings. It was much different for them. And for me, it was the first time that I had to work with that many people and certainly with, you know, a gospel choir. Things were going well. We did a couple of takes, but the um, the choir leader said he thought we could get another one. You know, he he thought we could still get really an over-the-top version of it. And... um, so he said, I just want to do something before we go in. I said, and he said, yeah, I want everybody to get in the circle. And this time we're going to hold hands and sing the song together. And um, that's basically what happened. And uh, it was such an emotional moment. I mean, I, I broke down in tears. I couldn't, you know, it was, it was one of those moments when you know you've captured something or something's happened to you that is, Game-changing. Well, as I understand it, there was a prayer that was given, wasn't there? Yes, yes, there was. Uh, When when the New Jersey Mass Choir was warming up their voices, and and then we were just about to run the track for the first time, they asked us for a minute, and and they all held hands in a big circle and said the Lord's Prayer. And, And then they said, we're ready. That was, I think, the reason why... You know, the emotion came through so much. So after about two two hours, I had a lead vocal that I thought was the one. So so when I came back in, he was wrapping up the New Jersey Mass Choir, and, and he played me their their uh, choir harmonies and and how how, how towards the end of the song. It, it it got it got bigger and bigger, you know. And, and then I took my tape out and played him the lead vocal, and they put my vocal on. And the first time we heard it, we were all in the control room crying, crying our eyes out. Very spiritual song. I Very mean, every spiritual. time you hear it. it, it feels a little sad 
towards the beginning, but it's a very hopeful song. As that song goes along, you just you just want to raise your arms and. I mean, that song, like you said, has become universal, not just about a relationship, but loving your neighbor, love for your fellow man. And I love, there was a story that I heard I always wanted to ask you about that sharing it with Amit Erdogan. Well, Amit Erdogan was somebody I really looked up to. He was um, sort of a mentor for me and um, a great record man, especially when it came to R&B and to soul music. You know, he was equally strong in those fields. We had just completed the uh, Agent Provocateur album, and uh, we were having a listening party, what we call a listening party, in the studio with people from the label and, you know, some press and stuff. And uh, I took Ahmed aside and I said, I'd like you to hear a song that I just finished on this new album we have. I took him into a, a small little studio room and I lined up the tape for I Want to Know What Love Is and uh, turned the lights down a bit and just played the song. Now this mountain I must climb. You know, here's a guy who's recorded Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, all those no. kinds of uh, no artists. Kidding. And um, I look over to him halfway through the song. A little time to look around me. And I see there's a tear running down his cheek. Wow. And... Just that moment was like, wow, it's got to be good if that's Armit's reaction. And I've actually made Armit cry. You know, it's such a great uh, experience. Really great. It looks like love has finally found me. Well, Jennifer Holiday too, her, her vocal at the end there, you and her going back and forth, just incredible. That idea was made in heaven, you know, that touched it off perfectly. Well, like I said, it, it, I mean, every couple of years it, it recharts the cover by Tina Arena. You wrote a bridge for her version. Me to be strong on this road I travel on. There was Mariah Carey and Winona Judd. You guys yeah. just re-recorded it with uh, Nate Roos of Fun. And that was a great re-recording. And then, of course, it's been used in so much pop culture. I mean, Modern Family and Glee. Parks and Recreation, Orange is the New Black, Rock of Ages. I I mean, it's just everywhere. And my, my kids have discovered it through those and... So many powerhouse vocalists. I mean, Celine Dion. Winona Judd. Mariah Carey. Patti LaBelle. But nobody touches your performance of that song. You, you balance the passion and that tenderness so perfectly. It looks like love has finally found me. It was very satisfying to, after the work that was put in that song, to, to hear it finished. Just such an incredible song. Just thank you for writing that. <laughs> Oh, you got you got it, man. So actually, I want to know what love is. It reached number one on the UK singles chart on January 15th of 1985, taking out one of the biggest songs ever, the charity single Band-Aids, Do They Know It's Christmas. Foreigner camped out there for three weeks. And then in the US, it knocked Madonna's long running Like a Virgin out of number one on the Billboard Hot 100 on February 2nd of 1985. It would actually be Foreigner's first and last number one hit. The song also spent five weeks at number one in Australia. It went to number one in Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, Norway, and Sweden. And it peaked at number two in Switzerland and South Africa. Like I said, it was number one everywhere. It's a spiritual song, it really is. Make sure to leave us a comment about this song. Lou Graham, Mick Jones, Foreigner. Are they the biggest Hall of Fame snub right now? I think they are. Where do you think that Lou Graham sits, the greatest vocalist of all time? 
Mick Jones as a songwriter, as a producer. Uh, what are your favorite foreign songs? Let's have a great discussion in the comment section below. Let's really celebrate this incredible band, once in a lifetime band. Make sure to look us up on Patreon for more content and subscribe if you haven't already. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the track.